Uh, I believe you were speaking about the Hispanic community here, the Latino, uh, the Latino voters or the, the members of the Latino community here in Washoe County. So like other parts of the country, it's very mysterious. It's difficult to figure out, right? You have the latest census saying 25 percent of uh, the residents here are Latino. However, it's difficult to know what percentage of that population can register to vote and what percentage actually votes. I've been speaking to members of the community. I went to the most popular restaurant, the most popular popular store where a lot of the Latinos uh, go buy their, uh, their clothing. And what they're telling me is that there's a large part of the Latino community here that are immigrants and uh, some undocumented that are not involved in the political process. And those that do vote are divided between the Republicans and the uh, Democrats. So it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to figure out how the Latino community here uh, votes and if they become involved. Another common thing uh, that I'm hearing, the theme that I'm hearing from these leaders is that they actually lack leadership in local politics. So this is a, a Hispanic community that is growing and that is changing, and it will make a difference in the elections uh, to come here in Washoe County. Right. You know, Guad, it's interesting. You know, in Clark County down in Las Vegas, it's the unions that are in many ways where the leadership in Hispanic, in the Hispanic community comes from, at least in the political side of things. But Reno is a bit more of a diversified economy. It's not as, it's not as uh, dependent on the casino industry as as others plus we're seeing an influx of californians are we not Correct. So we do have some casinos uh, here in Reno, um, but uh, the, the main driver of these jobs of the people that are migrating to work in Reno are really mm -hmm. the companies that are opening up uh, a lot of uh, new new spaces here. You have Tesla, you have Microsoft, Apple that have joined the industrial yep. park here, and they're opening up new operations, offering jobs to professionals that are coming from places like California. They're buying the homes. They're raising the price of homes. Uh, you think in Reno, you would never expect that in Reno, or in, in Washoe County, that is, the median price of a home is half a million dollars, $500,000 for the average home in this area. That's gone up almost 30%. So all these changes happening wow. because of the influx of people coming in to take these jobs. Uh, Guad Venegas in Washoe County Force. Guad, thank you. Let me move to Antonia Hilton in Anson, North Carolina. And Antonia, the question, as I discussed with Dante, why are we in Anson? You know, a lot of times, what's more important in our political divide, uh, particularly with African Americans? Is it, is it race or is it geography? And this is a home to many rural African Americans. That's right, Chuck. And look, this is a county, actually a rural county with a lot of contradictions here, particularly when you take a look at what's happening to the black community. So, you know, look, they have the plurality here, but when you look down, it's really they have a hair on their white and more conservative neighbors here. And over the years, as you and Dante talked about just a few minutes ago, the support for Democrats has been slipping. And so one of the questions here, right, was what's happening there? Is it that black voters in a county like Anson are falling for Trump now, or are some of them staying home? And what I'm finding in my conversations with community members here is that because of the challenges facing rural communities like Anson, many of them who are formerly very dedicated voters are starting to lose faith in the political process and starting to lose faith in the people who are supposed to represent them at the statewide and national levels. Look, Anson is a rural community where there are some people here who still don't have internet at home. There are some folks who do not have running water. The superintendent of the schools, who is one of the black major community leaders here, told me that about 75 percent of his school district is living in poverty, which has created intense challenges, not just through COVID, but in all of the recent years past. And, you know, it, there's this contradiction here where you see black people in leadership in the school system, the police chief on the Chamber of Commerce board. But then when you talk to them, they say they feel they're not heard in the political process mm. around the state or around this country. And, you know, it's leading some of even the older black voters. So we think of stereotypically as people who come out consistently to question whether their voice matters at all. I want you to take a listen to my conversation with Melanie County. She's on the board of the Chamber of Commerce and she owns a bed and breakfast here called the Dream Inn. And right now she sees voting as really just a, a, a hope, a prayer. Take a listen. Would you say people in Anson feel like their voices are heard at the state or national level? You would hear someone from the, on the state level say, we've got money coming. But where is it going? Is it going to where it needs to go? We need broadband, okay? That's something that has been an issue that should have been addressed long before COVID.
And to put what she's describing there in more context, I mean, this is also a community that's lost almost 10 percent of its population over the last 10 years. So when you talk to folks, they bring up the economy, they bring up jobs, they bring up confusion about where state support is actually going when it comes to Anson. But they also talk about their future and some existential questions that are facing them. You know, young black children here, they're looking around Anson and they don't see jobs. Mm -hmm. They don't see opportunity. Many of them are fleeing the county. And so when you talk to older black voters, they're also worried about that next generation coming up behind them, Chuck. Well, Antonia, a terrific, uh, a terrific introduction to why we're in Anson County. And again, this is something we've seen, particularly in quite a few rural African-American counties throughout the South. Antonia, thank you. Let me move over now to the other side of things. Dasha Burns is in Delaware County, Ohio. This is the lightest red of the three red counties that we're showcasing for the midterm cycle. And Dasha, in many ways, I believe you spent a lot of time in Kent County, Grand Rapids. Um, Delaware is slightly more Republican than Kent County is, but I'm guessing it looks quite familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, Chuck, I'm hearing echoes of really similar sentiments here. And when you say it's the lightest red, light red very recently. I mean, this has been a long time GOP stronghold. We're talking well over a century here. And when you look at the recent history, uh, since 2000, Republicans have been winning this county by double digits. But in 2020, the margin for Trump here narrowed by more than nine points. And there are a couple of factors at play here. One, the population here is just exploding. This is the fastest growing county in Ohio, and a lot of that growth is coming from Columbus, which is just south of here, a more urban, more uh, liberal area. But when we're talking about this project and we're talking about these key slices of the electorate, look, you, you've said this before, this is not a project that's looking at swing counties. Delaware County is not likely to go blue anytime soon, but the margins here are narrowing, and we're looking at moderate Republicans here. The folks we've been talking to call back to Ronald Reagan, to Gerald Ford, and they are feeling a little bit lost in today's GOP. And a lot of that has to do with Donald Trump. I want you to hear from one of the folks we talked to, Carl Gebhardt. He was actually the former GOP chair here in Delaware County. He voted for Trump in 2016, but he was actually part of that margin narrowing because he did not vote for him again in 2020, and he actually stepped down uh, from the party, uh, from the chairmanship because of Donald Trump. Take a listen to what he told me. I'm still a registered Republican. I probably will continue to register as a Republican until the point get, it gets to the point where I say, nah, this is just too crazy for me. I think people are struggling with that. And, you know, it will be very interesting to see if those folks that still have the conservative values, still have, you know, they were born and raised Republicans or always Republicans, if they come back to the party. And I'm, I'm hoping that that's being realized, you know, because if not, then there's going to be this group of people that are out there wandering around the political wilderness. But, Chuck, you talked to the current GOP chair here, which we did, Steve Cuckler, and he says that Republicans like Carl are going to come home for the midterms. Mm -hmm. He says what's happening under the Biden administration is actually helping the Republican Party right now. He says folks are unhappy with the rising gas prices, with inflation, with uh, the pullout from Afghanistan. Right. And he says that those are the things that are going to bring uh, folks like Carl back into the fold. But I'll tell you right now, a lot of people not talking so much about the midterms as they are about the upcoming local elections. What's happening at the national level has actually really trickled down locally here and you talk about this all the time Chuck school boards a lot of heated races coming up yep. next week that might give us a little bit of an indication uh, as to what we're looking at here uh, in the long term Chuck yeah all our local politics have sadly gone national uh, in the wrong ways there right. Dasha Burns thank you and if Dasha was in Delaware County and that was sort of the heart of the Bush Romney Republican Party where we find Ellison Barbara in Chattooga Georgia I would argue is an example of a county that really is the heart and soul of the Trump Republican Party. Marjorie Taylor Greene's district uh, is where this county lies. So, Ellison, tell us a little bit about Chattooga. 
Yes, yeah, Chatuca County, Georgia is one of the poorest counties in northwest Georgia. This is a place where they've seen a lot of jobs leave over the years, a lot of jobs tied to the textile industry that are no longer here. Uh, this is a place that has not voted for a Democrat in a presidential election since the late 90s when Bill Clinton won here in 1996. And ever since then, every four years, it just seems to get redder and redder. Donald Trump won this county last cycle with 80 percent of the vote. When you look at the numbers here, it's mind boggling because the population here has actually declined in recent years. But as the population was declining, voter turnout when Donald Trump was on the ballot in 2016 and 2020, voter turnout went up. So when you look at that, you have to think, wow, that's clearly being driven by one individual, Donald Trump. And if he's not on the ballot, will people here actually show up, turn out and vote? And what we're finding here is, yes, people are still paying close attention to politics in this community. And they say their support was not driven solely by Donald Trump. It was uh, that they felt, and this is how one person described it for me, they said that Donald Trump Trump did not create or uh, he this is here's how they put it. They said that Donald Trump understood the views and values of voters here, but he did not dictate them. So when I ask, well, will people still show up and vote in the midterm elections when he's not on the ballot? What I keep hearing again and again is yes. And the biggest driver behind people saying that they will turn out are social issues, particularly abortion. This is an evangelical community. Yeah. Almost everyone here identifies as Baptist or evangelical, and abortion is the driving issue, the biggest issue for them. Chuck? And we're going to have a lot, of, a lot of action in the courts on that issue throughout this Supreme Court term, which it'll be very interesting to see the impact it has in Chattooga. Ellison in Chattooga County, Georgia. Ellison, thank you. And we close with Shaq. Uh, Shaquille Brewster is in Duval. Uh, and again, sort of the sneaky swing county here in America, of, of a sprawling county, and if anyways, a, a, a mini version of Maricopa from, from two years ago. But what have you learned? Is this a, do Democrats and Republicans live next door to each other or across the county from each other? A little bit of both, Chuck. And let's just set up, set this up for our viewers a little bit. When we talk about Duval County, we're essentially talking about Jacksonville, Florida, a place that was a Republican stronghold for so long. And then in 2018, Democrats won it at a statewide level. And then 2020, President Biden flipped it. And, you know, you talk to voters here and there's a big resistance to aligning themselves with any uh, party here. People say that they don't want to be a Democrat or Republican. They like the idea of independence. And a sense that you get there is despite Democrats winning recent at the statewide elections, if you look local politics, the mayor, the city council are both mm -hmm. controlled by Republicans here. So you get a wide spectrum of opinions here. I want you to just listen to some of the conversations I've been having with voters and the warning signs for Democrats who feel like this county is trending their way. Nobody wants to pay a fair wage to anybody. Yeah. And, you know, the minimum wage is not kept up with the cost of anything. Even in the, in the party, in the Democratic Party, they're not agreeing. But uh, I think, you know, if they will work together, come together and, and find a solution. And I think they're, they look like they're close to getting some things done. I am concerned about the government taking, spending more and more money. You voted in 2020. Yes, and I will never vote again. Uh, Why not? Because there's no change. I don't feel like I was hurt. Following up on that last conversation, the Democratic chair here warned Democrats at a national level and said, you need to pass Biden's agenda. Voters are watching not only the Build Back Better plan, but they're looking for voting rights. They're looking for police reform. Those are the things that energize so many voters here. If you talk to politicians and more uh, people who are watching this at an academic level, they say the reason why you've seen this trend and this shift is, yes, you had suburban voters, more moderate voters who were turned off by President Trump, specifically his rhetoric. But you also had an increased turnout and you had population growth here. And if you don't turn out that Democratic base in swing counties like this, it will definitely stop the trend. And that's a warning that you're hearing from Democrats in this county, Chuck.